Nearing the end of the second week of free agency, the Seahawks finally added some beef on offense and defense in the trenches. We'll be diving into the latest free agency moves on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12, this is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined as always by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and a special thanks to each and every one of the 12s out there, whether you're listening up in Anchorage, Alaska, or over on the other side of the country in Portland, Maine. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We're going to have a special guest, Joe Marino from Locked On Bills, joining us later in the show to dive into new linebacker Tyrell Dotson and what he brings to Mike McDonald's defense. And we'll be dishing out our final wish list for who the Seahawks should cap off free agency signing to bolster this roster. It's going to be a jam-packed episode coming your way, courtesy of Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for $20 off. Your first purchase. Now for your lead story here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Up to this point on Monday, the Seahawks had not made any moves to truly bolster their offensive line in the interior, at least in the guard spots. The wait is finally over, however. The Seahawks on Monday agreeing to terms with Tremaine Ancrum, formerly of the Los Angeles Rams and Clemson Tigers, play a lot of snaps for the Tigers, so some really good football teams, two-time national champion. They also upgraded their defensive line with a name that we've talked about several times on the show earlier, Rob, because of his relationship with Adam Durde, the new defensive coordinator, previously the D-line coach in Dallas, bringing in massive DT Jonathan Hankins. Let's start with the addition of Ankrum. And if you look at the stats, he hasn't even played 200 career snaps in the NFL in four years with the Rams. Injuries have been part of that. But this is a player that I know you and I talked about in the 2020 draft process who has some positional flexibility. And when he's had opportunities to play for the Rams, I watched him play against the 49ers twice last year. And I thought he held up pretty well in those games at guard, a position that he, quite frankly, hasn't played much dating back to the start of his college career. Yeah, Corbin Tremaine Ankrum is a player that uh, I think the scouts are going to like more than the coaches because the scouts are going to see those projectable qualities. This is a guy, as you mentioned, that uh, played at Clemson, and he was primarily a right tackle, despite the fact that he's going to measure in at, at six foot two and 320 pounds with more of a guard-like build. He's got almost 34-inch arms, however. He is light on his feet, um, and because the L.A. Rams, while they had some problems with the tackle positions, they've been pretty stout among the interior of the offensive line. Then Tremaine Ankrum didn't get very many opportunities to play much over the last couple of seasons. So, you know, I, I think this is kudos to the Seahawks. They, their, their scouting staff, the pro scouting staff, there's a college scouting staff and a pro scouting staff. And I think that the pro scouting staff did a great job of seeing exactly what Ankrum is and how well that he might fit into the Seahawks. Now, is he going to be a plug and play replacement for Damian Lewis? I think that that is a bit of a roll of the dice. I still think that the interior of the offensive line, specifically left guard, is a position of concern for Seattle. We'll get into that a little bit later. But still, at this stage of the game in free agency, to get a player like Tremaine Ankrum, who has the size, the physicality, the light feet, the arm length that you're looking for, he projects as a starter in the NFL. If he was in this draft class, Corbin, we would be talking about a guy who's a top 100 pick. So for Seattle to basically get him for peanuts at this point in the process, I think, again, is just John Schneider and the Seahawks checking off another box, I think is a big check off because, as you mentioned, there has been basically a gaping hole other than Nick Harris, the center that has been signed in for agency. This, to me, is one of the ways in which the Seahawks are, are able to kind of solidify the interior of their offensive line. Yeah, I think that you've got to look at this as one of those wait-and-see type moves because, again, Ankrum has hardly played in the NFL. Last year was the most that he has played for the Rams, 
and he still didn't get to 100 snaps last year. He has had one start in his career. It was in 2022, and he only played a few snaps and he got hurt. So that's really been the issue is that he's had injuries every time that there may have been an opportunity for him to potentially play. And then you add in Kevin Dotson, who was acquired from the Steelers before last year, and Dotson had an all-pro caliber year. That's why they just opened the checkbook to give him a $16-plus million per year contract. That was some misfortune there because this was maybe the best chance Ankrum had to start in L.A., and then Dotson comes in and has a career year. So didn't get a lot of opportunities. But what I like about this kid is the fact that he played right tackle most of his career at Clemson. So he's got those light feet from playing there. He was a pretty darn good tackle for Clemson, too, two-time national champion. Played some guard his first year with the Tigers, but mainly was a tackle. So he's got those traits to transfer inside. He's a really solid zone-blocking lineman that – can get down and dirty in the trenches, maybe not necessarily his biggest strength. But this is a guy that I liked more than a seventh-round pick. That's what the Rams ended up taking him in 2020, seventh-rounder. So I think there's still some untapped upside for Scott Huff, the new line coach, to work with. But at the same time, I'm not going to be jumping to the conclusion this guy's starting either. He's going to have to probably beat out a rookie, or even if they don't draft somebody, I would expect that they're going to be bringing in some competition for him because you can't just throw him into the lineup and say, well, we're set with the fact that he's barely played in the NFL. As for the other addition, this is the one that I'm truly excited about because I have always been a big fan of Jonathan Hankins. I'm as big of a fan of him as, as the man we're talking about who is generously listed at 320 pounds on his player profile. If you've watched Jonathan Hankins play, uh, there's a lot more to him than 320 pounds, and that's not an insult. For a nose tackle, this guy takes up space. He is an underrated athlete for a player of that size. And there's been some pass rushing ability from him over the years. He hasn't been able to stick with one team very long. And I think you see that a lot with traditional nose tackles in today's NFL because teams just aren't ponying up cash for that. And yet uh, Mike McDonald in Baltimore, he wanted big guys like this in the middle of his defensive line. Seattle did not have a player like this with Boye, or not Boye Mafe, with Brian Monet being released last month. So they needed to bring some beef in for the interior defensive line. This guy's experienced. He's coming off the best pass rushing season he's had in his career with three sacks, playing for Adam Durde in Dallas. This connection's been obvious since that hiring by Mike McDonald, and now they're able to close the deal on a one-year contract. I think this is a big move, as big as the man that we're talking about here. Yeah, it may, may have been a Freudian slip when you mentioned uh, Brian Monet, but uh, I think that that is an appropriate name to mention. Whether it be Brian Monet, whether it be Al Woods, the Seahawks have had a couple of really stellar, true nose guard types over the last couple of seasons, and that's exactly what I think that Jonathan Hankins is. And as you mentioned, Corbin, he's got a great deal of familiarity with Ad and Durde's uh, system, and so I just think that that makes it that much more of a kind of a a, a hand in glove type of a fit. I mean, Jonathan Hankins, I, I don't think he's anything close to 320 pounds. I think he's close to 350 pounds, maybe even 360 pounds. I mean, he is really broad. He is really thick, and he is really powerful. And that's, of course, what you're looking for in a traditional nose guard. Um, you know, So I think that this is, again, another really logical signing for the Seahawks, it's relatively inexpensive. It is a guy that that fits in a huge area of concern for this club, and you're not gambling on an un, uh, you know, on a unpolished or unproven type. This, this Hankins was a was a highly regarded prospect coming out of Ohio State, very similar to Tremaine Ankrum, playing at a high level for four years, four year starter with back to Ankrum, um, you know, again at Clemson. So you're talking about national title contending college football teams. And that to me is one of the things that I'm excited about the signing for the Seahawks, just because this does feel like a plug and play type of a fit for the Seahawks. That is a schematic match, has a great deal of familiarity familiarity with the coaching staff and then again is still a relatively young player so again these are under the radar type of moves but these are the type of moves i think the seahawks frankly had to make because we talked about this before corbin before free agency was began the line of scrimmage was where the seahawks struggled the most a year ago and they just checked off two big boxes with their signings on tuesday 
Yeah, this really solidifies the defensive line because this is what they were missing. They didn't have that 340, 350-pound space plugger that also is more than being big, is an effective player in the trenches, which Hankins has been for quite some time, dating back to his career at Ohio State. So now you've got him, Leonard Williams, Jaron Reed, Draymond Jones, if he's still playing inside. And they've got some other players like Cameron Young that can learn from Jonathan Hankins. So I really like this signing all the way around. When we return, I'll be chatting with Joe Marino of Locked On Bills on new Seahawks linebacker Tyrell Dodson. And what he brings to the Seahawks defense, we'll get to that up next here on our Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry or start ripping your hair out when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of having to buy tickets. Want to see the NCAA tournament in the first or second round coming up this week? With Game Time's awesome flash time deals feature and a detailed stadium map, you can find awesome seats to watch the NCAA tournament in the first and second round for under $225. And it's super easy. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On. For $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s. As always, thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. As mentioned earlier on the show, we're happy to break down our next Seahawks free agent signing. And who better to break down Tyrell Dodson's game than Joe Marino of Locked On Bills. Joe, greatly appreciate you taking the time to share some insight on the intriguing young linebacker. Yeah, glad to do it and excited for Dodson to have what appears to be a great opportunity in Seattle. I know that both Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner are elsewhere. And so kind of replace them with a couple of AFC East guys and Jerome Baker and Tyrell Dotson. So excited for Dotson to have this chance. Dotson had only started five games leading up to last year. So he hadn't played very much on defense. Had you seen anything leading up to the 2023 season that suggested to you that if he had an opportunity that maybe he could be a starting caliber linebacker in the NFL? I think the most interesting thing about that is how the Bills stuck with him. And he was an undrafted free agent in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, uh, coming out of Texas A&M. And he very quickly, some information surfaced about uh, some red flags, some things in the past, uh, a DV incident. And for the Bills, who are really high on character, for them to like stick with him through that was kind of surprising to me for an undrafted free agent linebacker, right? Typically you say, all right, goodbye, move on with it. Uh, but they stuck with him and they stuck with him for a while and they kept him around for a reserve type role. He played a lot of special teams, had a few sp uh, spot starts filling in for, you know, Tremaine Edmonds or, or Matt Milano when they may have missed a game. But the fact that they stuck with him, I think was telling, it certainly had some moments in the preseason along the way, but not a whole lot of resume and actual regular season games until he got more of an opportunity this year and, and he performed well for himself. Speaking of those games that he played in last year, I believe he started 10 games at the end of the season for the bills. And obviously he was playing quite a bit in their playoff run as well. What did you see from him in his first extended action? How did he handle that opportunity? Obviously the Seahawks valued what they saw yeah. on film by giving him a contract. Yeah. The thing with Tyrell Dotson is he's a very good downhill player. He plays into the line of scrimmage. Well, he's very firm he can take on blocks. He can make tackles at or near the line of scrimmage against the run. He's very good at that. He's a good blitzer as well. So if you want to send him downhill, that's where you're really going to maximize what he can bring to the table. Now, that does come with uh, some limitations. He has some very real limitations in terms of range, coverage ability. Those are not strengths of him, of his. And I think the best way that you can understand that is when there were long and late downs, Dotson came off the field. They would actually bring because Matt Milano got injured for the Buffalo Bills. He's obviously yep. an outstanding matchup linebacker in the NFL. And so 
Dotson gets this opportunity to fill in Milano for Milano, and they're just very different players, right? They bring really different things to the table. And so the way that the Bills were able to get around some of deficient of the deficiencies that exist with Dotson was all right, Jordan Poyer would come down and play linebacker. They'd bring in Taylor Rapp to play deep safety, and Dotson would come off the field. And so for for Dotson, I think the key thing is putting him in situations that accentuate what he does well, and you want to mitigate the stuff that he doesn't do well, which is asking him to play in coverage, deep coverage drops. You're going to be very frustrated with him in those situations, but if you can keep him playing into the line of scrimmage, you're going to love what he puts on tape. I'm really curious to see what position the Seahawks are going to be playing him at in Mike McDonald's defense based on what you are describing with his game. And again, I take pro football focus grades with a grain of salt. They gave him a really good coverage grade last year, but the film I've watched so far, I would agree with your assessment that there's clearly some limitations there. As far as Mike or Will linebacker with that skill set, it screams Will linebacker to me, but Where do you see him fitting, especially with Jerome Baker, a player that you're familiar with playing against twice a year with the Miami Dolphins as far as how they're going to use those two players? Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and and I can understand why maybe you would think a a Will role, uh, but he didn't fit well into the Will role in Buffalo, and and that's because that's that's a matchup role for the Bills. That's the Matt Milano player, which we've already established. That's not really what Dotson does. So when you think downhill, processing between the box, you kind of want to say Mike linebacker. And now the interesting thing about that is Dotson did have the opportunity to win the Mike linebacker job this past year for Buffalo. He was up against Terrell Bernard uh, for that job in replacing Tremaine Edmonds. And Ed, uh, Terrell Bernard wound up having a, an injury that kind of kept him out of the entire preseason. And so Dotson's getting all this run with the starters to be the Mike linebacker. And then he winds up not winning the job when Bernard didn't even play in the preseason to really validate who he was at that point. I don't know if it was just a fact of, well, this is a guy that we took in the third round last year. This is the plan that we want. And then you put him out there and he winds up playing extremely well. And it looks like they made the right decision, but it was a little bit odd to me that Dotson got so many more reps, including literally the entire preseason with the ones And then when it came time for the bills to play in week one, it was like, Nope, Terrell Bernard is your starter. So and then he found his success, right? Playing in a weak side linebacker role, but in a very different style of role where they, they had to tailor the the role to fit him. And and one of the big talking points with Tyrell Dotson is the outstanding pro football focus grade. And, And it's extremely high. I think he's one of their highest graded linebackers in all of football last year. I think the important thing to realize with that is pro football focus grades on what a player is asked to do. They're not grading against the deficiencies that are there that force him to come off the field and the Bills to have to literally bring a a, a safety, a high-performing level safety to the linebacker position and bring in a reserve safety to get around those issues, right? That's that's going to help keep him at that upper echelon of grade when he's not having to do any of the things that he's not uh, adept at doing. And so I think there's layers to Dotson. Uh, I think you have to deploy him in the right way, but if you do, he can be very successful, I'm sure, with a defensive mind like Mike McDonald with some of the infrastructure that exists in Seattle defensively that he can fit fit in and he'll they'll find the right role for him but back to your question is is he a Mike is he a Will well I can make a case for either spot um, as long as you're mindful of what he doesn't do well I think in the Mike spot where where that could be really advantageous for him is typically those are shorter zone drops right Uh, more downhill type play and I think that's going to accentuate what he does more but that's also what Jerome Baker kind of does as well um, and, and I think Baker has a lot more coverage range uh, and upside in, in that capacity. So um, there's some interchangeability, which I think is intriguing. That should that should be exciting for Seahawks fans. Uh, but I think Baker's the far more complete player. Um, but kind of who's the Mike, who's the Will? That's what they pay Mike McDonald all the big bucks for. Yeah, and they paid Jerome Baker accordingly uh, based on the contract that came out. It sounds like he's going to get twice as much money as what Tyrell Dodson is. So maybe the Seahawks already know what they're getting in that regard. And I'm intrigued just from the sense you look at what Mike McDonald did in Baltimore with how much he blitzed both of his linebackers. Their weak side linebacker position with Patrick Queen was a lot different than what some other teams utilized that position. So I would think Mike McDonald might be looking at Dodson as a guy that can maybe do a lot of the same stuff that Patrick Queen did in Baltimore. We will have to wait and see. But 
This truly looks like one of those. It's a prove it deal. It's a one year contract. You are basing this contract off of 10 starts last year and very little playing time before that. He's only 25 years old, though, Joe. So, mm-hmm. what do you think the ceiling looks like for this kid? If the Seahawks know how to best utilize him, do you think that this guy has the ability to be a long term starter or? Do you see this being something where, well, this could be that wait and see approach in the next year. They're not sure if that's a guy we can move forward with. Yeah, I think the good news is that there is some level of proof of concept for as much as this is a prove it deal with a guy that has limited starting experience. There are I think it's so obvious what he does. Well, just ask him to do those things and you're going to get production. You're going to get impact tackles behind the line of scrimmage. He's going to be physical. He's going to blow up blockers in the hole. You're going to love that. And as long as you can keep him doing that, He's going to produce and, and he's going to be a revered player within you know the 12s in Seattle. Uh, and he's a high character guy. I know that he has a checkered pass, but like always known for his energy and, and what he kind of brought to the table as a as a teammate and, and in the locker room. All of that stuff's going to be really, really good. So it, it on the other side, right? You mentioned he's he is only 25 years old. And so you feel like there would be some ceiling. And you know, I think there's nothing better for a player than reps and time on task. And so for as much as I have harped on range and coverage limitations, well, what happens when this guy has more chances to do that, right? He's entering a situation where he's probably going to be viewed as a starter. He's going to get all that opportunity. He's going to get the communication down with everybody around him um, as a, a lead component of the defense, as opposed to, well, you're linebacker three or four, or maybe you're in contention for a job, right? He's going to have so much more a time on task and a reps to be able to solidify himself and develop that comfort because it's not like he's a slug. Like, don't get me wrong out here. It's not like he can't move and he's deficient and his in his feet are in, in, in the sand. Now he's not, he's not um, the most explosive linebacker, but he's not speed deficient to the point where he can't do it. Right. I think it's just a matter of getting those reps, getting that time on task. And it feels like Seattle's a really good spot for it. And certainly you think about that division and some of those wide zone rushing offenses and, and, you know, San Francisco and what the Rams want to do. Um, you know, that's, he's the type of player that can really help. Right. And he's played against that McDaniel team, a, a bunch in Miami. You know, I think all of that's going to really layer together. By the way, Jerome Baker probably knows a thing or two about defending those schemes as well. Right. So yep. I, I think, I think all of that works together to make it make sense for me. Um, but I'm certainly curious to see how it, it all ultimately plays out. If they do give him more chances to play in space, what type of real estate they ask him to, to cover in, you know, when, in some of the long and late downs. Um, but again, I still think there is proof of concept. I still think there is some upside and I think it's exciting for Tyrell Dotson to have this real chance to be a guy, right. And says of looking up at Matt Milano or Tremaine Edmonds or in his last year, he's, you know, well, can I beat out the third round pick that they drafted to replace tremendous kind of an uphill climb, right? This is, this is, he's to me, he's signed to be a, a fixture of this defense, at least in 2024. And if he does well, I'm sure they're going to want to keep him around for years to come. This might be the most fascinating signing the Seahawks made, not just because of who he's going to be asked to replace. I mean, a future hall of famer and Bobby yeah. Wagner, Jordan Brooks has been a pretty darn good starter in his four seasons and, New coaching staff. There's just a lot of variables at play. But as you mentioned, a young guy that seems to have a lot of room to grow. And if he gets more comfortable, instincts catch up. Maybe some of the issues he's had, he ends up getting a lot better in those deficiencies moving forward to the Seahawks. As always, a special thanks to Joe Marino for giving us that behind-the-scenes insight on a player that he has watched extensively with the Bills. Thank you so much, Joe. No problem, Corbin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Coming up next, Rob Rang will rejoin me and the two of us will dive into the missing free agent pieces that the Seahawks should be trying to sign before the start of the NFL draft next month. Don't go away. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets the most for your retirement thanks to the IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as a quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. 
The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA, available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker dealer. Greetings, 12s. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Special thanks to all the 12s, as always. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. And a special thanks to Joe Marino, who does a fantastic job covering the Buffalo Bills and giving us some fantastic insight on new Seahawks linebacker Tyrell Dodson. Make sure to check out Locked On's first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel coming up on March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern for the best MLB season preview coming exclusively on Locked On Sports Today. Again, that's March 20th. Get the first local insight from local MLB experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern on Locked On Sports Today. 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. The Seahawks announcing three signings in the last 24 hours, continuing to add players to their roster in free agency. Of course, there's still a few big names out there, but for fans that are wanting to see John Schneider make a bunch more moves, there is a reality check here, Rob. And you and I are not bean counters, as you like to put it. We're not salary cap experts. We prefer to talk about what happens on the field. But at the same time, over the cap has the Seahawks right now with $16.2 million in cap space, and that is without accounting for Tyrell Dodson's contract, Jerome Baker's contract, George Fant's contract, Artie Burns' contract, and now these three new contracts that have been announced in the last 24 hours. So if all of those deals have small cap hits even, you're not looking at very much cap space, and you have to have some available for your rookies in your reserve and bottom of the roster players. So They may need to make a few moves before they can even withstand the signings they've made so far. With that being said, we know Josh Snyder likes to extend players. He's been more willing to restructure players in recent years. So there's some mechanisms the Seahawks have to create some more cap space if the right free agent is out there. And so that leaves us with our final wish list. And I will admit, Rob, we were going to do this segment today. I was super excited to talk about Jonathan Hankins. He was going to be my selection as my wish list signing to cap off free agency, and it happened already. So there's a few other players out there, but I had to go back to the drawing board because I wanted the big fella in the middle of Seattle's defensive line, and they made it happen, reuniting him with Adam Durde. Yeah, exactly. And, and that would have been one of the, the biggest signs that I would have argued for as well. I mean, look, there's going to be a lot of Seahawks fans out there who are just looking at the number of Pro Bowls um, that the players who are not yet signed in for agency have. And and so considering the fact that Seattle has moved on from a couple of absolute stars in Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams, then Justin Simmons of the Denver Broncos would, would make an awful lot of sense, but he also costs an awful a lot of sense. So, you know, again, as you just mentioned, the, the Seahawks would have to really massage the salary cap to be able to sign a player like a Justin Simmons, perhaps even a player like a Jadavion Clowney. Look, I, if I have my druthers, an offensive lineman with the versatility and upside of a Connor Williams, even though he is coming off of a torn ACL that his own agent, Drew Rosenhaus, mentioned is a pretty significant tear. Um, I think that those are the types of players that, sure, it would make some sense if, if Seahawks fans are kind of clamoring for Seattle to add kind of one more log on to the fire. But uh, I think that, frankly, Seattle deserves an awful lot of credit. They basically had a grocery store list of different positions of concern, and they have checked off every single one of them, in my opinion, if this is the list of players that Seattle has signed in free agency, then, hey, let's get to April. Let's get to the NFL draft, and let's basically be able to, um, you know, fill in whatever other holes that you think that this roster has. I have a few gripes. I guess I'm not going to paint quite as rosy of a picture with the free agency list. At the same time, though, I do like both the linebackers that the Seahawks have added. We just learned more about Tyrell Dodson. He's 25. Drew Baker has been an underrated linebacker for a long time. Very productive, athletic guy, can make plays in coverage. We're going to learn more about him from one of our Locked On hosts in a future episode. But away from those two guys, the defensive tackle bringing in Hankins might be my favorite value move the Seahawks have made. 
I'm still looking at the guard spots and wondering what the game plan is there. I know this is a really good draft class, so you can address this position early in the draft if John Schneider is willing to do that. He has never drafted a guard, though, earlier than the third round. Maybe this is the year that changes. Maybe without Pete Carroll being involved, he's a guard. He literally said last Thursday that he thinks a lot of guards are overpaid and overdrafted. So who knows what the game plan is going to the draft. But even with somebody like Ankrum, we talked about the first quarter. This is a guy that has some upside, but he hasn't even played 200 snaps in his NFL career. So he really is an unknown from an NFL standpoint. You can't just chuck him into the lineup. He's going to have to beat somebody out. And if he does, great. That move suddenly looks even better. But I'm looking at the free agents that are out there and – I've talked about him already ad nauseum on this show, Rob. Dalton Reisner, to me, is a really solid guard. He's not going to be a top 10 guy, but I just don't understand why he didn't get any love. He didn't get signed until after the season started last year, and he's still on the market right now. I just think that he is a top 10 pass-protecting guard. He's not going to open up run lanes like some of the other guards out there, but I'm looking at a player like that and wondering why didn't Seattle make a move there instead of bringing in a relatively unproven player. And then you mentioned to Davion Clowney. I want to throw a couple other edge names that would make sense for the Seahawks. Randy Gregory actually has been mentioned as a player that the Seahawks are taking a look at, and it would make sense because like Hankins, Adam Durde coached him in Dallas earlier as a defensive line coach. So there's some familiarity there. I would think he and Daryl Taylor have two similar skill sets, and there'd be some repetitiveness there at the same time, though. Randy Gregory has always had talent. He's just had a lot of self-inflicted obstacles that have kept him from reaching his potential. He could be cheap to bring in on a one-year contract. And Tyus Bowser, if his knee is healthy, that's the huge question mark there. He's been injured the last couple of years. He is still a young enough player, though, that's been productive. He played for Mike McDonald. He and Jadeveon Clowney, if you're looking for that Ravens connection, would both be guys that, to me, make some sense. I'm still looking at that a position at his position with Daryl Taylor re-signing and almost none of that contract being guaranteed money, I'm wondering if they made that new contract just to give themselves some flexibility, if they can get a different edge to maybe flip him for a sixth or seventh round pick. I would be surprised by that. It's not saying it's not going to happen. I just think that kind of similar to what uh, Josh Schneider has kind of acknowledged already with D. Eskridge, that you just want a different coaching staff to be able to kind of get their hands on D. Eskridge and get their hands on Daryl Taylor. I mean, Corbin, I have, you know, slammed the table here for a couple of years. Now, Daryl Taylor is the quickest off the ball. He is the flashiest off the edge. He's got the bend that you're looking for. I want to see what Mike McDowell can do with that type of pass rush potential. So, yeah. I, I agree with you that there are still some intriguing edge rushers, Bowser, Gregory, um, Clowney. I mean, there, there's some guys who are out there. Of course, all of those players just mentioned that Mike McDonald uh, has a great deal of familiarity with. I think the toughest of the bunch of them is Clowney. And again, that to me is where Seattle really struggled a year ago. And that's why I think that they deserve some credit because in Tremaine Ancrum and in Jonathan Hankins, they they got bigger, they got more physical, they got stouter at the line of scrimmage. Um, and so again, I, I am excited about what Seattle has already brought. And I want to kind of just mention really quickly here, just because we did have Joe Marino. I think that Joe does a great job in terms of draft prospects and in terms of the locked on bills. I wanted to kind of mention one of the things that he talked about here for a second there with the linebacker and Tyrell Dodson compared to Jerome Baker. At least in my opinion, Corbin, they are two completely opposite players. In Tyrell Dodson, we're talking about F-150, just move people at the line of scrimmage. And then you are talking about a, a Ford Mustang type with uh, Jerome Baker. I mean, this is a guy that is best in space and Dodson is best attacking the line of scrimmage. Considering how much Seattle struggled in run defense a year ago, I think that Dodson checks that box. And considering how much that Seattle struggled for the last several years in terms of being able to uh, play pass defense against tight ends and running backs, I think that Baker checks, or excuse me, Jerome Baker checks that box. So I really think that Seattle got two completely different lines linebacker types because they're going to ask him to play two completely different linebacker roles. And again, I do think that these are going to be two players who are going to come into Seattle this season and have a great deal of success. I want to throw one more name real quick. He was on the bottom of our list. I know the Seahawks have not employed a real fullback 
since Mike Robinson retired years ago. They've thrown a few guys in the lineup. They had Will Tukuafu play it for a little bit, but generally Pete Carroll got away from using fullbacks. I think that you could see some Baltimore Ravens tradition seeping into Seattle's offense. And if you think Ryan Grubb has not used fullbacks, he didn't have a traditional fullback, but he put his tight ends in the backfield quite a bit at Washington. And he's got history at prior schools where he actually used a fullback. So bring back a fullback like Jacob Johnson. You can bring him in for a vet minimum, put him in at fullback when you need him. He can play some special teams, can catch the ball a little bit out of the backfield. The Ravens had so much success with Patrick Ricard. Why not bring in your own 250-plus pound battering ram that can help open up lanes in the run game and occasionally catch a pass for you? So that's just my that's my preference. I just want to see the fullback return to the Seahawks and help get that run game going again. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbett Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on our Wednesday show, continuing our free agency insider series, we'll be checking in with Mike DeBate of Locked On Patriots to take a look at tight end Pharaoh Brown. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for listening in and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Go Hawks.